Can I? Does this? Oh, it's on. Okay. Um, hey, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get started, and if people keep coming in, that's cool. Oh. Hey, Steve. Um, so it is my absolute pleasure tonight to introduce to you David Crabb. He is an artist, a storyteller, a teacher, a performance performer, and as he puts it, a uh, performing memoirist. Let him have it. Um, David is also an alumnus of the photography department, graduating in 1999. Um, for you NPR listeners, you'll surely recognize his voice. Since his Cranbrook years, David has gone on to host The Moth and Risk. Uh, his 2013 show, uh, solo show, Bad Kid, was named a New York Times critic pick, and Bad Kid the Memoir uh, was released in 2015, a must read if you haven't already. He has performed all over the world, and his work has reached new heights in his recent character storytelling hybrid piece, which you might get to see a glimpse of tonight, I think, yeah? Um, us and them, me and you. Currently, David lives in LA with his husband, Jack, their dog, Frankie, and is a visiting artist and professor of autobiographical performance at Occidental College. Um, David is also giving a storytelling workshop tomorrow from one until five. If you haven't signed up for it already, I highly recommend it. I've done it now twice and it's delightful. Um, you get to learn the arc of storytelling, do some story mining, and for those of you who like to share, you get that opportunity. Um, please join me in welcoming back David Crabb. Hi everybody, how are you doing? Thank you for, uh, for coming tonight. Um, I never called myself a performing memoirist, but I really like it. So whoever did that in the office, cool, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use that. Um, uh, that was a lovely introduction. That said a lot of it. Um, I've been here every year. I think this is the fourth year I've come. And typically, I just sort of tell stories. It's part of the programming at the top of the semester when everyone's getting here. And it's like an icebreaker. And I'm coming this uh, later this time. So I wanted to actually do more of a, of a presentation on my work mixed in with storytelling. Th what I'm basically telling you right now is I don't know what's going to happen. But thank you. Um, uh, you all look a lot more, it's funny, typically when I come to the beginning of the semester, I feel like it, there's a little bit more this, and you all look very settled in and chill w versus like terrified. Um, when I came to Cranbrook, uh, we did student photos, and I'll always remember um, that someone did the math a second year and realized that I was the second youngest person at the entire school besides uh, Scooby Lepowski, who I think he's come here recently. Did Scooby come here recently? Yeah, Scooby was the baby, but I was like the real baby. And I had graduated from undergrad in Texas, and I was so late in graduating that I had to take a summer course, and there really wasn't a spot in, in, in photo, but my professor knew Carl Toth and was like, there actually is a spot, and can you go? So I graduated, found out I was coming here, and got here in 10 days. Like, that was the, the span of time. And I felt shell-shocked and terrified, and I think I was maybe here the first week. Everyone was using language I didn't understand. Uh, most people were old, like 29. Um, and I, I, uh, had, I had been able to drink literally maybe for like seven, eight months uh, when I came here. That was my, where I was age-wise. And I remember my first week here, I felt so scared that I went, I took my phone outside of my dorm room and in the office, I called my father and I literally cried and was like, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> I didn't know the architecture of the building yet and I didn't realize that there were transom windows over all of the dorm rooms that were pretty much all open. And later once I settled in and loved it here and never wanted to go, a joke that everyone liked was that night that I wept in the hallway calling my daddy in Texas to tell him maybe I wanted to come home from Big Scary Cranbrook. Um, <laughs> and not much has changed, uh, honestly, since then. So, um, so, yeah, so when I was here, I came here for photography, and, you know, it was Cranbrook, so the minute I started in photography, they were like, stop taking photos. Um, <laughs> go spend time in fiber. I was like, ah! Um, so, so, I, uh, no, but I, I really did, Carl Toth uh, was uh, the head of the department, really thoughtful, uh, very cerebral, intellectual guy. His work could not have been more different than the work I was creating, which were these very like uh, uh, sort of heroin chic, weird, uh, sort of like sexy, oh, isn't that nice? Um, can you tell I, 
<laughs> Can you tell I usually just tell stories? Um, great, we'll go back in a minute. Uh, and then I got here and um, Carl actually kind of like uh, uh, recognized this, this sort of difference. Uh, he, he is a great, uh, he gave me great feedback and great critique, but he also was like, I see what you're interested in. There's like some comedy here. You're interested in some elements of fashion. Go to printmaking, go here, go here. And by the time I graduated, I was pretty much just doing like performance, almost sketch comedy video art, mostly about how silly I thought the process of what I was making was. Hence critiques where Heather McGill from Sculpture would come to my studio and be like, I love it. I, lo I mean, you know you can't show any of this, yeah? Okay, great. <laughs> really funny, it's really reverent, yeah. You know, you're never, okay, great. Uh, uh, so I was sort of, uh, and then I moved to New York, and, um, and then just sort of had this trajectory as a performer and writer. Um, and I think maybe just to get started right out of the gate, uh, Elizabeth kind of talked to you a lot about what I do now and how I got into storytelling and what I do with hosting the moth. Um, but I thought just right out of the gate, I'd just tell you a story. Uh, and then I'll sort of backtrack into some work. And because I know it's going to happen, and you don't really want to see icebergs and humpback whales. Nope, that's not how that works, David. <laughs> Great. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> so I lived in New York uh, with my husband from uh, 99 to uh, the very beginning of 2016. And I remember when I moved to Los Angeles three years ago, I was so excited. Um, I remember one day I was driving down the street on Sunset and my little Chihuahua Jack Russell Charlie was literally asleep in a moving car at 40 miles an hour, which like even my dog was chilled out in California. He just like cooked like a burrito all day in the sun. And I was driving down Sunset, beautiful day, the windows were down, my dog is sleeping. And that Don Henley song, The Boys of Summer, comes on the radio. I saw a deadhead sticker on a Cadillac, right? And I burst into tears. <laughs> like, I just was like, ah! Like, not sad tears, but like really jubilant, emotional tears. And then I started cackling, but not really happy laughter. That sort of like, I've been tortured for a long time and survived something uh, after being in New York for 16 years. If you've seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there's a great scene at the end where like the final girl, she barely escapes into the bed of a pickup truck and she's covered in the blood of all of her dead friends just looking at Leatherface going <laughs> And that's how I felt, like that's who I was. But my Leatherface was New York, do you know what I mean? Um, and I loved it, I loved being in Los Angeles, it was the best, um, but there's like a honeymoon period when you move to LA and most people that relocate there talk about this, that there's this sort of like fabulous, the weather's so great, you know, why didn't I, it's like Eden, and then all of a sudden all the cliche things start happening, like, you know, in New York, for example, I would tell people, oh, come see my solo show or my storytelling thing, and they would be like, David, I'm gonna be there. You know, I'm sharing this railroad apartment with these two polyamorous clowns, and the heat has gone out, so I'm gonna get two trains and a bus to come see you tell a four-minute story in Red Hook at a Pitbull fundraiser. I'm gonna see you, right? And in Los Angeles, I moved, and like I enjoyed it, but then I would start doing things, and like really good friends of mine, actually some friends I went to Cranbrook with specifically were like, oh, David, We'd love to come to your thing, but we're having Pinot Grigio under a lemon tree. And I, I just don't drive east past Rowena after 5.30 on a weekday, but break legs, really. Uh, have, have a good time. Um, and it's, it was lonely. There was this kind of like loneliness to being in Los Angeles. And also there's just, you just don't see people as much. There was so much about living in New York that felt like n functioning in New York was just learning to accept that this is normal. What's happening right now is normal, right? Uh, lots of encounters with rodents or parts of rodents um, in public spaces, uh, strange noises, bad smells. I even when life was bad in New York, there was this sort of something visceral and energized about it. And LA just felt like, ah, oh, the horizon line, isn't it beautiful? Yes, and there's no one here looking at it with me like that, right? Um, but then this amazing thing happened and I met uh, this woman, Delaney. And have you ever met one of those friends that's like, I I'm an only child, so I have this feeling really strong when it happens, because it's not just like meeting a friend that feels like a sibling. For me, that feeling is not even something I've ever had. So when I feel it, it's like powerful. And I, get a, I can get a little single white female maybe, right? Like when I'm like, I like you. Um, and I 
really, really liked Delaney, but she was just as intense about me, and it was great. She was like my little sister. We made each other laugh. Um, she lived not too far from me, so we couldn't use like geography as a reason not to hang out, and it was awesome. Like I had a, a nice little network of friends, but I had a very small little group of friends in LA, and she was a really special part of it. And then one day, she says, I'm seeing someone, and it's pretty serious. And you know that thing that happens when you have a really good friend and they start seeing someone and you're like, oh, okay, well, how is this gonna affect me? Um, <laughs> because there's the first part of my brain just went straight to the idea like, you know, the, the, the little part for me is like, well, will I like them? But that goes away quick and it gets replaced with, well, they like me. <laughs> like, like, is this all my sibling friend needed was someone who was rational to be like, why are you fucking friends with David? That guy's gross and awful. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it was a ruse, right? So I was excited about meeting Trevor. I met him the first time. Lovely, nice. We barely talked. And it was a few weeks after that when Delaney was like, hey, uh, let's have a, a double date tonight. You and your husband Jack and me and Trevor. And I was like, great. And she's like, and first we're going to come to your show at Occidental. Now, I teach devised storytelling, at least that's what I was teaching in Occidental. Devised storytelling means students um, work on true first-person stories, they tell them in a super traditional way, and after a month or six weeks in that process, we devise them, which results in a trans student um, outfitting a men's room like a discotheque with a glitter ball and telling you the story of his identity in public bathrooms as you are forced to put glitter on your face and look at yourself in a mirror. You know, theater. Um, it is weird and immersive and interactive, and I was just like so nervous about this person coming to see like a theater show and being asked to walk to four rooms and wear a mask, all the stuff, right? But they come to the show, and they love it. And afterwards, we're like, well, let's go and have this dinner. Now, we live in a really sleepy part of Los Angeles called Eagle Rock. I love Eagle Rock, but at, after like 9.30, there's nothing open. So we get on the phone and we find this one place and this guy answers, it really took me back because he stands up like he was like a guy from Queens. And I was like, how long are you open? He's like, we're gonna be open for another 45 minutes. And I'm like, do you have a uh, booze? Yes, we'll be right there. So we got in the car and we went to this place in our neighborhood where the college is, I'd never been to in my life, called The Capri. Now, you know when you walk into a place or a situation and it's so clear when you think back that everything was trying to tell you something. Yeah. When we walked in, the first thing we saw as we waited to get a table, there was no one else eating in the restaurant, was a guy walking back from a customer, leaving the men's room, and he was walking, he was like, good night. And the little host guy that I talked to on the phone stopped the guy and he just pointed and he said, your baby? <laughs> Alone, at a table, it was just a baby, like a baby in the little chair that hooks into the car. Like, like he was like, oh, oh, my wallet. Like he went over and he grabbed his baby and we looked at each other like, that's weird, right? Like that guy's, th they just treated that like, hey, mister, don't forget your change, you know? Don't forget the little human life you've created. Have a good night. Um, he takes the baby and it's just us. We sit in the front of the restaurant and I'm trying to be cool, and I want Trevor to like me, and uh, the, the guy comes up who runs the place, he's like, welcome to the Capri, just remember, we only close in 40 minutes, and I'm like, I know, I talked to you on the phone, it's cool, we're gonna just in and out, have a quick little appetizer, he's like, okay, what can I get you, uh, and I'm like, well, what kind of red wine do you have, and he literally looked at us and said, red, great, um, we'll have four glasses of that, and he sort of, he kind of, he, he was interesting because as he walked away, he was sort of a short, rotund guy, but it was an optical illusion because as he walked away, he passed the table where he was also sitting, an angry version of him counting change. And that was when we also realized that this restaurant was operated and owned by very tiny twin men who seemingly were very different attitudinally, right? There was a happy, joyful one that was front of house and one that just sneered with wads of money at us throughout the rest of the meal. Weird. Uh, he goes away. And we talk, and then we look, we hear him first, and the guy that sat us is walking towards us with four wine glasses on a tray, and he's literally walking like this. Whoa, whoa, it's like, did you train at Camino Del Arte? Because this can't be really how you, he gets up to the table as we're all kind of backing away, tips the tray, and all four glasses of red wine shatter, right? Trevor's on the outside, so it splatters totally on him, and there's glass everywhere, and the guy's like, oh, I'm so sorry, and he kind of waddles away to like get rags or something. 
And then I kind of look, and, I, and Trevor's like, oh, that was weird. And I realize that his forehead is beaded, like with sweat, and he's like, oh, I don't feel so good. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, David, you're really messing this up. Then the waitress comes up. The waitress comes up, and she was having some sort of, like, maybe physiological, like, MDMA experience. I don't know what was happening, but, like, whatever it was was kicking in. Uh, she came up to the table, and she was like, hi. Uh, what can I get? Like, she was touching her hair, and, like, she had a cap on, and she kept trying to pull it, so, like, all the way over her face. It was so strange. She took our little food order, walked away, and then we look up, and it's the same guy. He's coming with water this time, four glasses of water. Oh, whoa! Oh, whoa! He gets to the edge of the table, and the whole tray falls, and four glasses of water, they're plastic that this time, thank God, fall everywhere. Some of it goes up on Trevor, and at this point, he, he's covered in, he has wine and water, and he just looks at Delaney and says, I think I'm going to be sick, like very quiet under his breath. At this point, I flip over the menu, which I'm holding onto for dear life, and I looked at the back of the menu, and I see Gordon Ramsay. And Gordon Ramsay is in a photo with a twin on each side of him, and as they come to clean up wine and water and the ecstasy waitress comes back, we realize this is one of those restaurants that Gordon Ramsay saved on Kitchen Nightmares. <laughs> the whole history of the restaurant, how Gordon Ramsay saved them, yada, yada, yada. And I'm just like, this is, this is just the worst thing that ever happened. Now, at this point, the waitress disappears. Tweedledee and Tweedledum disappear. We're sitting in the restaurant alone, and through the window in the back, you see like the line cook who kind of looks like Nosferatu in a wig. Um, he's got like a cap pulled down, and he's like, oh, you see steam, because I guess the, you know, the, the griddle is there on the other side of the window. And he's just kind of staring at us through this fog of cooking, you know? And when we try to like look at him, he'll look away, and at some point, someone says something to him, and he comes around the door, and he has a tray with four glasses of water. We're finally getting a drink. It's been 15 minutes. And as he comes up, whatever seems scary about him is suddenly vulnerable and soft and more terrified of us than we are of him. And he walks up to us with the water, like he's never done this before, a greasy, dirty apron, like someone is having him go do this. And as he gets up to us, he looks, and with great sadness, he s proceeds to start saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I don't know what happened to the guy, but he had some sort of rotation issue with his wrist so that it couldn't turn to fully grab a glass, so each of our waters, he had to only use his hand as a kind of pincher and plunge his thumb into each glass of water, grip it, and then just say, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I'm very sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like, literally, like with each glass of water. And I'm like, what is happening? What is going on? Trevor looks down, and he's like, there's something in my water, and there's like a chai floating in his water. And it was just the worst thing. Finally, we like scarf down our food. We're just trying to get through it. And we get out of the restaurant. We're walking out. It's 1031. We're a minute past when they close. And as we walk out, we paid our check with nothing taken off. And as we walk out, Tweedledee comes up and says, hope you have a good night. And remember, next time, earlier is better. <laughs> we separate. It's very uncomfortable. I think this is just such a foreboding negative thing for this friendship that I really want to last. And a few days later, Trevor started a group thread where he's like, look at what I found online. And it was the link to the episode of Kitchen Nightmares about those brothers and that restaurant. And a week later, he came over to our beautiful house. It was peaceful. We watched the sun go down all together with our dog. We sat in our living room, and we had delicious wine, red wine that had a name. And we watched this episode of Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares as these twin brothers screamed and cried, one wretched over a box of like rotten fennel. I mean, it was really just all the feelings. It was like everything you want from a Kitchen Nightmares. And it was really, really lovely. And you know, um, uh, LA might be lonely and sad and isolating sometimes, but sometimes you just need a really fucked up New York night uh, to make it work. Thank you. That restaurant closed like a week ago, and I'm so happy for everyone and so sad. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like both things. Um, so that's uh, the format in which a lot of the work that when I started doing storytelling in a really straightforward way, I did. 
Um, I uh, started telling stories around town at the Moth Slam. If you're familiar with the Moth, the Moth is a storytelling event where people can go in, they put their names on a piece of paper, there's three or four hundred of them in a room, and ten of them get called and tell stories. Uh, the event is competitive, which is the weirdest thing in the world, uh, but there's literally three teams with like Olympic numbers that judge the people's true life stories. Uh, I always like to joke when I host that uh, uh, it's kind of like Project Runway, if that show was just Tim Gunn walking around 20 episodes of 20 people, well, everyone's still doing great. There just wouldn't be much to watch. Um, the competitive element sort of makes it really fun for people, and I think it's probably why people got so addicted to the moth. So I started doing that and hosting the moth and telling all these stories, and uh, at that point I was working in a theater company called Axis Theater in the West Village, uh, doing a lot of um, immersive original theater work. But I was sort of feeling like I wanted to create something of my own, especially as I told more stories. So I paired with my friend Josh Matthews, who is a clown, like a trained clown, actually does Commedia dell'arte and mask work. Uh, his special thing he does is he does that David, uh, that David Bowie, it's called contact juggling. If you've seen Labyrinth, where the ball just looks like it's moving on its own accord all across your body. Um, and uh, he was like, let's make a show together. I want to direct you in a show. So we started working on a show, and very quickly he's like, why are you standing still? <laughs> I'm a clown. There's going to be two dance numbers. You're going to have a wireless mic. And this process of creating with him was kind of what changed the way that I thought about storytelling. Um, we were trying to make a show together about waiting tables um, uh, the week after 9-11 near Ground Zero, because we wanted to make a comedy, kidding. Um, and that was going nowhere for us creatively. It was dark, uh, we didn't know what we were doing. And Josh was like, you know, you keep going to all these moth events and you win these slams and you're telling all these stories about being a goth kid in Texas in the 90s. And I'm like, well, yeah, like that's like, that's my oof, you know what I mean? Like, that's my thing. He's like, <coughs> why aren't we making a show about that? And I was like, well, what would we call it? And he was like, I don't know, Bad Kid. And then that was the show we made. So we made the show called um, Bad Kid. And just to give you an example, like this is just a little clip of me telling a story from this time um, at the Sydney Opera House a couple years ago. In San Antonio, Texas in 1991, I oh. was a goth kid. Mm. Uh, I had a very specific group of friends. For a uh, making a lot of cool sounds. Hmm. Did I turn the screen forward? I went, to, I went to school with Carla. Carla was in my year, so I really feel like it's a flashback now of just Carla coming to fix something that's not working. <laughs> You did this thing before. <laughs> oh, no, now everyone's coming. <laughs> this is why I don't have AV. I should just tell stories. No, just forget it. No. Uh, if what works is unplugging it and plugging it in again, I'm really going to. There we go. Don't touch it. I won't. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Um, here we go. Let's try it again. I wore a lot of dog collars as fashion accessories. There was a lot of torn fishnet and uh, misty black eyes. Uh, we changed our, na our names to things like Raven and Salem and Epiphany. <laughs> we made facial piercings out of office supplies. And we wrote poetry that was really like way too dark for any of you to understand, you know? <laughs> and I love this group of people so much because I spent most of middle school as sort of a closeted outsider. And when I met these kids, I finally felt like I found my crew. Like uh, being gay was like the least interesting thing about me. They were like, that's all you got, you know? Um, and, and, and we were so happy being so sad together. So that was sort of, so and then a few years in high school of, um, uh, being of that format, you know, it's just very straightforward and you stand at a mic and, um, and my friend Josh was really like, let's activate this um, because he knew that I loved doing characters. He'd seen me do work with the theater company that I'd been with for eight years, I think at that point. So here's like a little trailer for, um, for the show that we built out of it. I 
had never seen kids like this before. They were wearing smeared makeup and they had crazy styled hair and long draping black clothes. If you've never seen goth kids in a warm weather climate, there's nothing sadder. It's just... <laughs> well, I'll be. They look like superheroes going to a funeral. <laughs> Son, I, I, I never, ever hated you. I never hated you. I just hated your goddamn friends. Goddamn, I hate you. Okay. Hi, I'm Greg. How old do I look? <laughs> You're funny. Bitch, we're gonna have fun tonight. I put three hits of Black Widow acid in that Dr. Pepper. You know, skinheads are straight edge. They don't like smoke weed or whatever. Sharps will do whatever. Like I huffed Scotch Guard like 30 minutes ago. So. You bring home anyone, anyone, and your stepfather and I will love them if you do. They could be black or Asian or Latino or or handicapped. Yeah. Your stepfather will build a ramp into this house if that's what it takes for you to get the love you deserve. How do I look here? Am I shining? What if I'm not, am I shining? If I do like this though? What about like this? Is the light okay? Okay, give me the drink. I've been doing that thing that you do when you're really fucked up and you're trying to act sober, but it just makes everything seem more like pronounced and bizarre, you know? Hi, Dad! Yeah, 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 nothing good can last. Uh, uh, oh, I know, let me try this. Let me, let me try, let me, let me change it up. No, did I just make it worse? Did I just make everything worse? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just want to tell people stories. Let's see. What, 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 what is the thing I should be choosing? Wow, I love that this has unlocked a real, you know, a real fisher in the community. Um. No, he should use BY. He doesn't have the password for that. Never guessed is stupid. Um. Huh? Carla. It's fine for now. I can talk a little bit. There's not much more to that anyway, y'all. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Why don't you just dance for us? <laughs> I'll refresh it, Carla. <laughs> I had never seen her. And and dare I, and dare I, let's see. You're really fucked up and you're trying to act sober, but it just makes okay, everything let's hold, more, like, everyone let's be optimistic. bizarre, you know? Hi, Dad! Boys. So, so, so that that was a, a real different way. Oh, and the other thing about um, thinking of storytelling this way is, you know, with m with moth storytelling, I really loved it, but it was so straightforward, which is kind of the beauty and magic of it, right? It's just a human at a microphone. Uh, but one of the things that I'd missed about making work for the years I worked in a theater company was telling stories was that I actually, you know, I was still really connected to the visual and I hadn't really had an outlet for that. So here's just like a little, this is just a little trailer that uh, I got to make for the show that I still really love.
Bad Bad Kid uh, ran uh, just for like four short shows the first time, and then uh, we did a proper run um, a few months later. And that one randomly a New York Times critic came to, and you usually don't you know when that's going to happen. Like someone from the house tells you, or if you're one of those actors, they're like, "Don't tell Felicia the New York Times is here; she'll wreck it." Right? I'm Felicia. P.S. Um, so luckily, I didn't know it was a great show, and the New York Times gave it a critic's pick, which was so much more than we ever. Um, could have asked for it. And when that happens, when you end up with a New York Times Critics Pick show, this weird thing happens where a bunch of lit agents just send you like blind, like they don't even try to make it seem like they know you. They just send you like Facebook messages, like, wanna write a book, kid? It's like really creepy and weird. And this one lovely guy uh, actually came to the show. And uh, over the course of the next year, I wrote the memoir. And it was really exciting to have this this piece that had existed already in multiple ways exists in yet another piece. There were stories about it, and then there was, uh, you know, a, a, a much more sort of theatrically stylized piece, and then there was a memoir. And you know, writing the uh, the memoir was a real challenge because when I got the offer to write it, I was like, well, I already have a script for a 75-minute show. Like the book is written. Uh, that's not how words work, David. Um, it takes a lot more words to fill up a book. Uh, so that was like a whole process of really sort of digging into what it meant to write for the page in that sense. Um, and then that book came out, and um, yeah. And then when we moved to um, Los Angeles shortly after that, um, I had really wanted to get more involved in the performance side of things. I would say as, a, as an artist, I've, I go back and forth a lot between very isolated, lonely work, whether it's preparing a story or telling a story or being at a mic alone, and then I, I freak out like an animal one day. Like, I don't want anything to be real. I want it all to be fictional. I want to be on stage with 20 people. I want there to be a lot of music, and there needs to be a fog machine. And then, and then I get my jams out on that, and then I'm like, I just want to write about nature. Right? I just, like, I have my thing, right? So um, what I started doing when I moved to LA immediately was working with a theater company called The Groundlings. Um, and when I say working with, I mean like just taking like workshops because it takes a while to really get in that community. Um, and The Groundlings, if you don't know it, um, The Groundlings is an improv company, a lot like UCB or Second City, but they come at improv and sketch from a really, really character place. Um, they want you to be, they, you have to actually literally audition, so it's more like a conservatory. And a bunch of SNL people have come from there, Will Forte, Will Arnett, Kristen Wiig, uh, Melissa McCarthy, a lot of people. So. Um, when I started doing that, let's see, do I have, yeah, yeah, oh, and just for uh, shits and giggles, that's uh, Kelly Osborne reading my book. Anyway, um, <laughs> my friend tagged me that one day, I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, I don't know, I was just on her Instagram, and she's reading your book at an airport <laughs> with her white Pomeranian, so, <laughs> any, you know, any press is good press. Um, so, uh, when I started working at Groundlings, it was really fun to dig back into character work, right? Again, this I, these worlds feel very separate for me at this point, right? There's a performance fiction world about character. There's a storytelling world that's alone at a mic. It's all very true. There's a book writing place. So, so this was me sort of just really immersing myself in like acting and character and comedy for a while. And this is a, a character that, um, uh, let's see, where, where, where do I put him? That is... This guy, just so you get a close up before, because you're not really gonna get, it doesn't do justice, the angle, all right? Um, and this is, uh, this is, this is linoleum. The president of the United States of America. <laughs> linoleum. <laughs> but bitch, what happened? Oh. America, I am just so glad that you're here tonight. I'm going to announce some new initiatives that I'm very, very excited about. So thank you all for going to the polls last November and saying yes to Linoleum for president. If you would have told me 20 years ago that I would be standing here tonight before you all, I would have told you, get your fucking soup away from me. I don't want your fucking soup, lady. There's bugs in it. That's because 20 years ago, I was in an upstate New York rehab facility called Second Chances. <laughs> Much like 
like America these last four years, I was a fucking nightmare. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know who I was. I mean, I knew that I was one of the fiercest ruling divas of the New York City underworld, right? But I didn't know if I was gay, straight, or bi. Was I male or female or other? Was I a Christian or an atheist or a Scientologist or a Jackson? You know? <laughs> and that time down there with my drug use, it showed me things. Really, it did. So I'm very excited to announce tonight uh, my new program, The Combat Addiction, and our beautiful country, BTAC, Bad Trips for America's Kids. <laughs> now, starting this summer, on their 15th birthday, every teenager will be checked into an inpatient program where a team of medical professionals and a few club friends of mine from the 90s will plunge them into a medically mon monitored but terrifying K-hole. <laughs> Or get scared straight. Honey, this is scared shitless. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, now listen, so, to be clear, I'm so this was like a this was a really fun way to kind of get back into um, some of the character work. And actually this was, you know, of all the stuff I did at Cranbrook, like this right now is probably most in line with the art that I made the whole two years that I was here. This human wreck uh, of a nightmare. Um, um, now after that happened, uh, I started working at, uh, I started working with Occidental College, which is out in East LA. And um, they wanted me to teach a class uh, on autobiographical performance, um, which yielded this show called If It Happened to You. And the process for making the show was sort of something I was piecing together from my own experiences as a performer and writer, where I was giving the students this opportunity to tell true stories in a very traditional mock style. And then, after a month or two, we were finding ways to devise those theater works. So uh, students were encouraged to go tell stories in new places, to tell, tell stories with soundtracks, uh, to write two-person scenes from their stories. And in the end, it yielded this really beautiful sort of promenade-style uh, theater piece. Um, and if you've, uh, promenade-style sort of means that you separate the audience and they move around. If any of you have seen Sleep No More uh, in New York, it's this idea that as uh, a spectator, you're kind of independent, right? But you're also very shepherded by design to different places. Um, and yeah, so, so, so this piece was kind of about how do they incorporate all of their stories, right? Um, and some of their stories were very specific to ensemble work. Um, this girl, uh, let's see, is there, yeah. So this girl's name was Alex, and she told this great story that was so sad and funny about how her parents got divorced when she was little, at two or three, and then they did that thing that divorced parents do where they try to be the cooler parent by giving the child more like agency, which is kind of a nightmare. So when she had her sixth birthday, her dad wanted to be cool and he's like, I'll pay for everything, you can have your own party. So she planned this huge thing at Chuck E. Cheese, had like two cakes, rented out the whole thing, but no one ever told her that you have to invite people to a party. So she had this beautiful thing her dad gave her, but because her, he gave her ultimate freedom, she spent it alone, literally alone. And she told the story about being in the ball pit and waiting and eating the cake and waiting. So we created this like really fun ensemble scene called Two Birthdays, where she wrote a techno song that we all created together. Um, and all of these uh, kids kind of came out and like sang this techno song, a very sort of German techno song about two birthdays. Um, and then, let's see, where's, yeah, and this, w this was a room where um, a girl told a very funny story about how she thought her dorm room was haunted, and we paired her piece with a story from a guy about a friend that he lost in high school in a bus accident. So this room, you know, a big part of my ethos around telling stories is like salty and sweet. I like contrast. Um, that to me is the most kind of rewarding emotional space to be in when I'm looking at or listening to art. So in this room, I really loved it because it started as this very funny light thing about a ghost and a haunting. And then it became this very actually, uh, very quite, quite serious and sentimental thing, uh, remembering this guy's friend. Um, uh, this was a girl who had told some stories about her acting coach who got her to talk about abuse she'd suffered by opening her, uh, her throat chakra. So in the end, she was a brilliant actress. So I was like, why don't you just make the theater piece you as the teacher and you force the audience to go through the workshop? So uh, again, very active theater um, in a lot of these rooms. And then this was one of, the, one of the most interesting pieces because I think it spoke so much to the way, you know, when I teach storytelling, I love storytelling because it gives people an opportunity to just communicate as themselves. Granted, when they get on stage, it's probably them on steroids to an extent, right? It's them a little bit bigger, a little bit louder. Um, but it also allows you to learn things about what you think is true about yourself. Um, sure, there's a final product that you hear on NPR when you hear the moth, 
where that person's probably thought through all those things. They've been handled very carefully by a team of directors. But there's a first process to telling stories where I feel like sometimes you reveal things and hopefully you're in like a safe, cool space where people can hear what you've said and be like, hey, are you sure about this? Um, and this, uh, this woman is a very talented young comedian. She does a lot of improv in LA. I had her, I guess this is two or three years ago. And she's a stand-up. And she told us this funny story about how she got out of improv practice one night and this guy said, I can give you a ride home. And then he passed her exit. And when she said, what are you doing? He was like, oh, I'm just kidding. Wouldn't it be weird if I kidnapped you? And then she was like, you're being a jerk. And then they laughed more and he kept passing the exits. And then eventually they ended up in the parking lot of his apartment complex. And she was sitting in the car and she was telling us, she was like, and it was like crazy, right? Because like, what kind of weirdo is doing this? And when she was done with the whole story, we all had to tell her like, you realize that's fucked up, right? Like what happened? And, and in the end, he drove her back home and it was, they obviously didn't hang out a lot after that. Um, but we had to tell her, you realize that what happened to you. And she had this like emotional kind of break right in front of us where she knew from the start of telling the story that it was a serious thing, that she was in danger, but she was used to processing it all as stand-up comedy. So in her piece, which is one of my favorite things that I've gotten to do with the students, it was like a fake stand-up club, and it was loud. There was like the wall of design of a stand-up club, and the audience came in, and they sat down, and then she came out, and she did her set, and she's actually a really funny uh, comedian. Like, I, I cringe when I think a lot of you are probably like, stand-up? She's so good. She's so funny. She starts telling the story, and as she tells the story, the diameter of the light on her starts to narrow, and that fabric is made of a very thin, gauzy material, so there are two headlight operators in the back, so as her story becomes more daunting, the headlights, what looks like a giant car is coming behind her. And by the time she was done, she told it from this real place of like fear and anxiety, the way she really felt at the time with this sort of headlight kind of looming behind her. And it was this really beautiful kind of visual representation of the way a story like that can work, right? It can take you from one emotional space to another. Um, yes, yes, that's just a really pretty picture. <laughs> These two folks both had mothers who, w her, one of their mothers was an alcoholic and uh, the guy Will's mom was uh, going through chemo. And they told these stories about their moms and in both stories they had this common thing, both of their mothers fell down the stairs one night and almost, I mean, and got seriously injured. One of them because she was blackout drunk and the other because she was on so many chemo drugs she got lost and thought she was walking into the bathroom. So they uh, developed this beautiful, almost like tandem storytelling piece where they actually traversed this like staircase as they told it at that moment together. Allegra, a Buto class. <laughs> and then, you know, again, like I encourage the students or when I'm making my work, like, well, what's another element? Like, how does the show keep going or feel like it's still living in another space? So when the audience came out of this show thinking it was all over, uh, the theater crew had made these beautiful face cutout things that incorporated scenes from all the rooms you've just been in uh, to have your photo taken. You know him? So working at Groundlings uh, while I was teaching this class was fun. Uh, 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 this guy's name is uh, Bobby, and Bobby is uh, one of the most famous commercial voiceover artists of all time. Uh, he sang the Folgers theme, just so you know. Uh, this is a terrible nightmare of a human uh, who, a very sexually frustrated man in Oakley's uh, trying to have a three-way with his pool boy. Um, <laughs> and I hear there's a lot of dogs here now, so let's get into it. Um, so this is my dog, Charlie. Um, as I was, um, as I was working uh, uh, at Groundlings and directing this show, um, this thing was happening. So I'll just tell you, you know, I'll just tell you this in the story context that it uh, exists. So um, the beginning of 2018 uh, uh, was very intense. It almost kind of felt like 2017 had known that we were bitching about it and 2018 was like, hold my earrings. Do you know what I mean? Um, uh, we were, we spent a whole month of that year homeless. Um, we had gone through this uh, terrifying thing with being evicted as we were trying to save our dog from cancer. He got diagnosed with a brain tumor and for five or six months we were going back and forth endlessly to different clinics to visit him and try and figure out what we could do. 
uh, we unfortunately lost him. And when we lost him, we lost him right before we had to move out of this house for a month um, uh, to move into this house that we had found. It was actually quite lovely. And it was just a bad time. We had this bizarre period where all during the month of May, we were homeless. And I say homeless, but when you have a nice network of friends and people who care about you, I meant we did a lot of plant watering and cat sitting. Do you know what I mean? We lived in four or five different places, driving around LA, taking care of people's plants and dogs and pets, checking on them. And the first place that we arrived uh, during what was really one of the most sort of deep depressions of my life was a tiny apartment with a window looking right onto the big blue Scientology dormitory. Uh, that you've seen in all the movies about Scientology. And it was a really weird headspace to be in, in like the shadow of loss, feeling not grounded, feeling like I didn't have a home or like I, there was no anchor, to just l sit and just stare. Because you know, in LA, Scientologists are just a part of the vibe there. They, they have the pamphlets all the time. They're always walking by and they're like red lobster waiter outfits wanting you to like read something or hold the soup cans, whatever. And you just kind of pass them by, but it's weird it was weird to be in an apartment where I could look out a window and I could just watch. I could just Jane Goodall that shit. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, I would sit in that window. Now, to explain what my days were like, you know, I am the person with the more flexible schedule. My husband is a piano teacher. He has set students. Uh, he also uh, was a head bartender at a restaurant at the time. So when it came down to our dog needing constant care and someone to go visit him, I kind of took on that role in no way that I resented. I just had the more flexible schedule because of how I work. So to have now no house and kind of avoid, I just watched. You know, my husband was going on and living his life and doing his jobs, and I was like, no, I'm going to stay here. And I had my little CBD vape pen that I had, and I would just CBD myself to heaven and stare at Scientologists. That was my reality. And um, the weird thing about watching them for an extended period of time is that you start to kind of like see the rhythm of the performance. Um, you know, so the big blue building, there's 20 of them, they all have their red lobster, really polyester pants. You can actually pfft, pfft, like hear them when they're coming. Um, and they're very busy, the Scientologists outside the big blue building. There's lots of those little plastic key rings with lots of keys, walkie talkies. Kenneth, he's gonna be right there. Like there's this like urgency, right? Like what is happening that's such a big deal? There's always people with clipboards pointing. What's happening, right? And when you can watch long enough, you start to kind of like see the loop. And I got to thinking like, I was like, there's no one in that building, man. There's no one in there, bruh. Like, I was like, whoa, it's like all an illusion. Um, because I just kept seeing the same people, the same people over and over. And there would be this thing where Jack and I would park the car, and we would have to walk through them. And it felt kind of like bowling. We felt like bowling balls on the sidewalk because there would be little clusters, three of them, talking very quietly. And the moment you get two feet away, they'd pow, Scientologists, like spinning away. <laughs> and one day, one day we were, I was walking down the street, and there was a Scientologist, I was with my husband, we get out of the car, and we know he's a Scientologist because he was like, he was actually cute and young and fit and didn't look like he cut his hair with a Flobie and arrived from like 1982. Like he just seemed like a normal young guy. We wanted to be like, what's happening? And he looks at us, he's like, hey, and that was even weird. He was like, oh, he must be new. He doesn't know, that's not allowed. And he, 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 he did his little, look, hey, hey, talking to his people. And then he got to the end of the sidewalk, he said hi to us, and then he realized there was no other Scientologist left to talk to, and it was kind of like watching someone have the tiniest little psychotic break. He just went, ha, huh. and then went back into the building. Like he was so lost at the end of the sidewalk with no one that he literally like Dora the Explorer, I forgot something, and went inside the building. It was so crazy to watch. And after, after like a week of this, my husband was like, Babe, I'm worried about you. What have you done today? I was like, well, I watched. It's really fascinating. The one with the red hair parks your car there. And then the other, you know, he was like, look, you, you, you have to, like, you have to get out of this rut, and you have to talk to someone, and I think you should call that phone number. When my husband said this, uh, the phone number he was referring to was a number that came on the box of our dog's ashes when it arrived. Um, they send you the biohazard. They have a little piece of paper, and it says, if you need help, dealing with this. We have a licensed grief therapist that deals specifically with pet loss, and you get a free one-hour call with her. So I called the number, 
And I was setting it up with a very nice woman, and then she said, oh, and just by the way, just so you know, if you don't want to do this, you can actually go to a series of three in-person meetings that happen every other Wednesday at a person's private home in Venice. And I'm like, oh, I need people, man. Like, I'm going to do that. She's like, just to be clear, it's fine. I just want to make sure you know this is a person's private home. I said, oh, like, do you not want me to do it? It was, like, really weird. She, she's like, okay. So a few days later, I get in my car, I drive out to Venice, about 6 p.m., I get to the house, <laughs> and I, I go inside, and I'm greeted by, like, everyone's eighth grade nurse, eighth grade school nurse, just like a tight little perm, a little floral coal. She's just the loveliest woman. She takes me into the kitchen, and all the snacks are laid out on those paper fluted edge plates. There's, like, the baby carrots with the water from the baby carrots gathering, you know, the Oreos fanned out. She has little things of goldfish, and she's just so sweet to me, whatever you need, whatever you need. And then she's like, Barbara, and I turn and Barbara's coming in. Barbara is an L.A. type of woman. Um, Barbara has some work that's settled nicely. Um, <laughs> she is wearing, like, big, like, palazzo pants and, like, pigtails and has chunky glasses. Like, she was, like, an actress that was in some rooms and saw some shit, and now she just, like, makes granola and saves dogs. Do you know what I mean? Like, she's, that's where she's at now. She's 47. She's 58. She was lovely, and she had big, funky earrings. Those, like, uh, yeah, yeah, she was a lot. And we're talking, and they're like, come in here. You, you have to meet Catherine. And I go in, and there is Catherine, who's clearly the therapist. And you know her hair is fabulous, and it's blown out. She's wearing the, that, like, you know the amethyst necklace that has little ants, like, trapped in amber inside of it? <laughs> have you ever seen those? She's wearing one of those. Everything's gauzy. It's like there's a fan on her. She's got her journal and some books. And she hugs me, welcomes me. I sit down. And th after a beat, it was just the four of us, Catherine says, well, you know, the three of us have been meeting every other week for, my God, the last 10 years. And I guess tonight it's just you, David. Let's get started. I'm like, okay, that's weird. No one else is here, just me. Okay, great. And I should tell you, I wasn't, we weren't really just the four of us. There were also other... Um, you know those collapsible baby pins that people bring to parties? You know, it's like a little vinyl thing. It expands. You can put your baby in it. There were about four or five of those in the room, and each one was full of no less than four or five elderly chihuahuas, uh, four of which were wearing dresses, <laughs> uh, little pastel, beautiful dresses. Those are Barbara's dogs that she saves. So we start. And the first few minutes, uh, I, like, I made a terrible mistake. These are three old friends talking about their lives. I feel like I'm invading their space. This is like so weird right now. I don't really have a lot to say. And then finally, after a little bit, Catherine looks at me and she says, David, do you want to tell us about your loss? And boy, do I. I like white it out. I don't know what happened. I know there was a lot of weeping, like, Julie, like that wet Julianne Moore snot <laughs> crying. Um, I know I started talking about my father and my job and where I'm going with my profession and how I never wanted to have this sort of rift with some of my family members and my dog, my dog, my dog, my dog. Just a full, like at one point I looked down and I was holding one of those little dogs <laughs> in a dress. Like I don't remember getting it. Someone must have been like, get him a chihuahua, you know, just like. Um, and I'm just like holding this little dog in this beautiful little lavender dress who's like looking at me and I'm like, <laughs> like just crying so much. And then finally, when it's all over, which could have been like five minutes or half an hour, I don't know, um, you know, Catherine says, hey, when you were talking just then, you said a few things. Uh, and I want to point out how often you said repeatedly, it's just a dog, it's just a dog, it's just a dog. And I said, yeah. I said, I teach storytelling. A lot of the work I've done is nonprofit. I feel like I've sat in rooms with people who've lost, like, their children. They've seen their friends die in front of them, fighting overseas for our country. I, 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 don't, I don't deserve to feel this sad about this. And she said, that's a really common thing. A lot of people feel it. Um, and then I said, I just feel like it's a dog, and it could have been any dog. I said, on top of that, that's my fear, that, right? Like, I, like, that it doesn't matter. A dog's a dog. And she says, I want to tell you something. She said, I've been saving dogs for 20 years, and I have had a lot of dogs. And I will tell you that it, it stinks when you have to say goodbye to them. But every fourth or fifth dog I've had is different and special and matters more because of the connection. So A, a dog is not a dog is not a dog. And B, 
if you feel like this sadness isn't serving any purpose in your life, I want to tell you a little secret. It's a thing I do. And she tells me about a dog she'd lost a few years earlier named Bixby. And she said Bixby was really hard. And I felt like I couldn't dig myself up. So I started doing a thing where every day I did something nice. And I told myself it was for Bixby. Sometimes it was small, like I held the door really long for a lot of people. She said sometimes it was like I gave my friend a $50 donation on their, you know, seed and spark for their theater piece they're building. But whatever it is, I say I'm doing it for Bixby and it makes the pain matter. And when she said that, like it just really, everything really like hit. Like I was like, oh God, I'm supposed, I'm supposed to be here. Like I'm so glad I'm here right now. And as I'm thinking about all of this, Two of the women start talking again, and, and then I hear one of them say, well, yeah, you know, I mean, she still comes through the washing machine at least once a week. <laughs> and I say, what? <laughs> and she's like, oh, you know, a lot of our dogs visit us through, you know, electrical currents. It's a thing with her. It's her washing machine. With me, it's the basement lights on and off all the time. She is such a little <laughs> jester. And I'm like, what the fuck is happening right now? <laughs> And they start talking legitimately about how so many of the spirits of the dead dogs they've lost, like, turn lights on and off in the car, the washing machine. I'm like, mm-hmm, mm, yeah, of course. Uh, and as this is happening, I'm trying to process it. And then one of the women mentions my daughter, well, my daughter. And I'm trying to, like, come out of it. And I'm like, that's so sweet you say that. I, I've, I've never, I never called Charlie my son, but I do have that. She, she, saw me, she said, oh, no, 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 you misunderstand me. This dog was actually my daughter 300 years ago. It was the feudal system, so we were both, and I was like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> she had a whole story about the surf and her daughter, and they weren't appreciated. And as this is happening, I'm like, what? And I looked, and even like I looked down, and even the little like milk-eyed, like no teeth dog is shivering, looking at me like, this is fucked up, right, man? Like <laughs> even the dog is like, what is this? And they're talking and talking and talking, and, and I don't know how to take part in this level of talk. And it's not about believing or not believing or not respecting. I'm just so surprised that this is where we've gone. Do you know what I mean? And a few minutes later, the meeting wraps, and I, I sort of say goodbye, and I get a hug, and I get in the car, and as I drive home, I'm like, that was nuts, and I'm not going back there in two weeks. I think I got out what I needed to get out. It's crazy. And I get home that night, and I'm putting myself to bed. I hit my, <laughs> I hit my CBD pipe 18,000 times. I stumble into the bed. My husband's still away at work. And I lay there. And I'm almost asleep when the white noise machine next to the bed just goes <laughs> And I remember I kind of clutched the sheets and I sat up. And I said, Charlie. And I had that thing when you do the crazy thing and then you kind of come out of your body and you're seeing the movie you're in, you're like, he's nuts. <laughs> like, and I'm thinking about this and I look out the window and out the window is just glowing blue, right? The big blue Scientology building. And I'm thinking like, I'm a grown man sitting homeless in this person's bed, staring at like the icon of one of the biggest cults in the world, thinking that the ghost of my dog is coming to me in white noise through a sound machine. And the weird thing is the moment I, I processed that, I thought, oh shit, it's not true. Like there was that part of me that was like, that would be great if that was true. That would be kind of cool. And I started crying and I fell asleep. And the next day, I got up, and I was in a really low place. I had nowhere to go, but I did that thing that you do when you're depressed, when you just get dressed, and you hope by the time the second shoe's on, you know where you're headed <laughs> when you walk out the door. And I was walking down the street, and I looked up at the Big Blue Scientology building. It was this beautiful day in LA, perfect weather, like 72 degrees, gorgeous. And I looked up, and I had noticed this before, but I realized that none of their blinds are open. It's a dormitory, and it's beautiful weather. This, I mean, LA is just such a gorgeous place to live, and these people, who are giving their lives away are not allowed to open their blinds. They're always closed. And I looked up at just like, you know, 14 stories of closed windows with blinds, and I thought, man, that stinks. And right as that happened, my phone lit up, and I got this little Facebook notification because this guy, a storyteller in the community who I, I really didn't know that well, I met him like two times. He was only like 23, and he was diagnosed with some kind of cancer and needed treatment, and someone had started a GoFundMe. So, you know, I was in it with all my emotions. I was like, I'm gonna get in there. I'm in so much debt from the cancer center, but I'm gonna give $5 to this guy. And I opened it on my phone, 
and I, you know, I put in the amount, and right before I pushed send, you know, there's a little box it, where it says to put your name, you know, my donation in honor of. So I started typing, and I put like his Christian name, the whole thing, Charlie Whitepaw, in the box. And then I, and then I paused, and I was like, this is connected to Facebook, right? Like, I'm going to push enter, and I'm going to be that, that guy that, like, yeah, David, he's going through it. He's donating to people's cancer funds in the name of his dead dog. Is he okay? Has someone checked on him? And then I was like, oh, no, I'm going to do it. Uh, and I pushed enter, and, you know, um, uh, I felt like for a moment it felt like he was there, like I got what she talked about. Um, so I never went back uh, to visit them, but I'm very happy to this day that I had that weird night with those three uh, witches of Eastwick. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and I know he was pretty cool. This is a lovely drawing my friend made, but just because this is such a downer, this is Frankie. Uh, this is the, the, new, the new guy. Well, he's not really new anymore, but um, yeah. And wouldn't it be weird if the rest of this was, oh, and this is, he has like, I don't know what, I, we don't know what he is, but I don't know how his hair does this. <laughs> he will come up to me sometimes and I'm like, girl, fix your wig. It's like, <laughs> what happens? Like, I, 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 I own that dog and I don't know where that hair comes from. <laughs> um, oh, he's, he's the best. So, um, so, right after this experience, I don't want to keep you all for too long, uh, right after this experience happened, I, um, we moved into this house. Um, it was a beautiful uh, sort of faculty house. It was the kind of house, the kind of magic thing that happens where we never could have afforded this house in LA. But uh, I was teaching at Occidental. There was an um, English professor going on sabbatical, and he couldn't sublet his house or he'd lose it. So the school connected us, and they're like, there's this little one-bedroom house with like a full yard and a white picket fence. And I was like, sign me up. And it really felt like this place where I knew for like a year to 14 months I was just going to go and like just make work and chill and heal and get better. And it was the most beautiful place. And when I went there, I took with me this feeling that I had had, that Scientology experience really like, I don't know, it did something to me. I mean, I've always been fascinated by cults and group thought, but that was just being on top of it and being able to see it like that really got me thinking. So I started playing around at Groundlings a little bit with this character named Peter Creswick, who is a, a cult leader. Um, <laughs> and I started thinking about, like, I don't know what the place for this guy that runs this cult is. Like, I don't know what theater piece he's a part of, and I don't know where to put it up. And my husband was like, well, you know, you're teaching this class where you're encouraging your students to, like, put up their theater, in, like, in a public bathroom if that's all they have. You have a beautiful house with a yard. Why don't you just do it here? So I designed this piece called The Union. Oh, I have a video. I'll show you. Um, and let's see, where is that? Here we go. I'll show a little of it. From a distance, the stars and the sky seem so close. But in truth, like the humans down below, they are light years apart, set adrift, alone. In this solitude, the sorrows of an individual's life can multiply like rain until the downpour of them fills up an ocean of loss. Do the people around you know you? Have you let them bathe in your ocean? Have you told them the story of who you are? Or have you remained a solitary star, a raindrop in orbit, alone? You want to tell your story, but to whom? You can tell me. I'm Peter Crestwick, and this is the Union. The Union is not one planetary body, but a constellation of beings working together to tell their truths, their pains, their stories. Through cutting-edge technological advancements in electromagnetic imaging and cognitive behavioral therapy, the Union will build a better you. In conjunction with next-level brain mapping and genetic recoding performed by the best neuroscience experts on the globe, the Union is building a better world. A multi-week on-site story progression therapy and narrative reprogramming techniques have helped thousands of members share the people they were and recalibrate the people they meant to be. But none of this can be done alone. 
The uncovering of the one needs the legion. You have fallen from the constellation, but we are back to reclaim your light. Your union needs you. The union is life. The union is togetherness. The union is you. But are you the union? Take a chance. Take the test. Take my hand. I'm Peter Cresswick. Won't you join us? The union. And I arranged individual boutique half-hour pieces, which... The Union will be holding their next story transpositions for prospective members on... The night of October 30th, 2018. At the home of Union member... David Crabb. To arrange your 20-minute narrative probe and candidate evaluation, email the Union host at... TheDavidCrabb at gmail.com. So what I did is I just uh, did this piece. Um, I just performed this piece uh, for one person at a time, and I was interested in a few things. I was interested in uh, sort of dealing with some of my own very real pain and also thinking about, well, who goes to a cult and what do they need from it when they go? So um, I set up these uh, meetings. I gave people these ridiculous questionnaires. They came to my house, which was lit up all purple at night. And there was like, like whale music playing. You know those like silver, you know like joggers get those like mylar sheets when they run? I hung those all over the house so the minute you walked in the living room, you were just in a weird mirrored network. Um, and I bought those programmable um, light bulbs that you can like change over time so the color would shift. And they basically came in, and um, uh, that's me in, in, in the realm. I have a box, and what they want is in the box, and what they need is in the box, is the whole thing. Uh, a finger, I would tie this, uh, this thing around their finger and have them tell me a story uh, from their life. And, the, uh, and this is just some iconography. I sort of hid these little, each person had a binder. So when I came out, I had their name on a binder. Um, but some of the other names mixed into the design were actually very famous cult leaders. Um, I think that's the last, yeah. <laughs> um, so what would happen is they'd sit at that table and I really wanted to play with the idea of character and truth. What does that mean with story and what does that mean with this groundlings thing? What does that mean with a cult that professes to do all these things that at the core is empty or money pit? So I basically did this thing where people came and they sat with me and I asked them some really absurd questions. It was very comical, very like sketchy right at the top. And then I let them tell me a story. And some people told me the funniest little stories. They knew it was called a story transposition in exchange, so they were prepared. And then some people really used the opportunity to like really like cry to me uh, or tell me things. There was a man that came that cried to me with his wife on the porch, unable to talk to her about the thing. And then other people just told me crazy stories but the fun part of this was that at the end, I actually uh, would tell a story as Peter and D character, uh, meaning when I told them my story at the end, which was inspired by theirs, I would be me by the end of it. I took off the glasses, I shook out my hair. Um, there were a few versions of this where I would go into the kitchen as Peter and come out as a completely different, as one of the voices you heard at the end. Like the guy that talked like this, he had like a long wig. He was like a burnout guy that like loved the Grateful Dead, but he needed something new. Uh, so he came out and there was this idea of like unveiling. And it was this funny sort of comical piece, but it ended each time after 20 minutes with us kind of standing and someone looking at me and being like, you're you now, right? <laughs> and I'm being like, yeah, are you? <laughs> um, and like, and anyway, it was, it was really eye opening. And the thing that all the people said about it was that that transition part that seeing, seeing someone talk to you like this as a character in wig and glasses, and then as they go on, you talk a little more, and then all of a sudden they don't realize or perceive that the person is suddenly them was something that people that came to it were like, I'm just, I've never, I want to I wanna understand that. Like, that is the weirdest thing to me. Um, so I got excited about that too. Uh, and uh, this is the last show that I directed at the school, which, just for time's sake, I don't want to keep you all a really long time, um, was very similar, promenade-style theater based around the idea of a hosted cabaret. 
Um, uh, this is actually my student that did the piece in the men's room that was outfitted like a disco type with Lady Gaga blaring. He's my favorite. Um, but don't tell any of the other students. Uh, I think I'm safe. Um, and uh, this piece really dug deep on uh, n not using available lighting. So the audience members were given flashlights to light a lot of this. They got to select uh, what action uh, was highlighted. Um, this is a girl telling a story about how uh, her mother's an immigrant and one night in a parking lot, a bunch of uh, LAPD choppers surrounded them um, and it was only lit uh, by the flashlights of the cops. It was really great. Uh, this, um <laughs> this was a fun medical dance we did. This was Kimberly. Uh, Kimberly was a new age uh, character who basically gave all the people at the show some semblance of a yoga breath, a stretch, something like that. Um, she pulled people up, did some fun stuff. And then, so this is Patty, and this is the last thing I did. Patty was born of, um, well, my past. Uh, Patty, Patty is a real kind of woman from growing up in Texas who uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to make work about. Uh, so I built this show called Us and Them and Me and You. Um, like I said, I was really interested in, um, I, keep, I, I keep digging down harder on the idea of, of, of opposition, of salty and sweet, of dark and light, of I'm playing a character, it's fake, I'm telling a story, it's me. So I built this show around the idea um, that could have existed just as, as one piece. Um, the first half of the show was me coming out and telling a lot of the a lot of the stories I just told y'all, uh, this was really inspired by my dog. It actually started off as a solo piece about like my dog, and I would tell people that and be like, "That's ridiculous, right? That I'm that sad about my dog." And you know what happens? Some people would say yes, and if anyone ever loved the dog, they'd say, "No, please make it." Um, so the first half of the show was me basically sort of telling the story about this year that I had, and I I, I positioned the show in a way where I said, you know, my aunt is here. Um, She's here from out of town. Uh, you know, she wanted to get away. She's never been to LA. She's having a fun time. Um, and then I basically told the story of, of the year. And it was kind of a rant that I tried to make really, really comical so people could bear it. Because I really dug into what it meant to, you know, to have a sick pet that you love, to go into debt over that, to spend months and months visiting them and signing up for treatments you don't know if it will work. And, you know, it was very heavy for people. And I actually duck out of the show at the intermission. Like I, I, I just, I say, I'll be back. I can't go on. And what happens in the second half of the show is this woman comes out, my Aunt Patty, um, who proceeds to, in a very stylized character way, um, sort of do her own show. Um, the idea and what, what really interested me about it was I was really interested in talking about, because when I was going through my thing with my dog, I was talking to a lot of people about that. And they were going through their own things that felt super external about the world right now, about politics. And I feel like in the last two years, I'm surrounded by people, friends, people I care about, who feel like they're all having that, in, that external, internal thing. They're like, I feel like there's this weight, and I don't know if it's coming from the culture, I don't know if it's coming from loss. And I wanted to like talk about that in some way. And Patty, to me, is, is uh, a woman who is very much a part of that. Pat, uh, Patty talks like this. Um, Patty's from Minerva, Texas, and she is so happy to be here. Ha! Ah! Uh, that's how she's the whole time. And the thing about Patty is that she's a type of woman in Texas who has a heart full of love. Her husband has been voting for her for 20 years. She thinks gay people are fine, but it's, you don't have to talk about it. Like that. Like it's this whole very Southern mentality of like, this person who's really good at heart and trying, but they don't understand the culture, they don't know how to take part. So I wanted to essentially create a show in two halves that was kind of archetypally almost the same story told by me feeling like I'm out of, like, like I'm out of place in the world and her in her hometown talking about how she feels like she's out of place, right? Because my mom is very much her, if you push it all the way to waving a freedom flag and tell, she, my mom has a sign like, if you voted for Trump, you're not allowed to come in here. I'm like, good luck, mom, um, in the center of Texas. So, you know, uh, uh, Patty, is, Patty is my mom, but like not, not evolved in a lot of ways. And I wanted these two people to be able to tell their story in these two halves. And what I wanted to play with was the idea of the unveil. So what happened in the show is that 
as Patty is telling a story at the end, she's sort of like a DJ would turn out. She becomes me in the end. Um, and I ran that show a while, and it was, uh, it, was, it was thrilling, but it started to feel like it wasn't at home in the theater. And uh, leave it to my husband, who obviously, as you can tell from now, really does not mind having guests. He said, uh, why don't you do it in our home? So I made an event. There were like $30 tickets, and it was this 10 audience a time immersive piece in my house where I got to do all of this stuff that felt like it lived in the space and was real, but I got to actually do it. Like there was no Patty talking about the house. Patty got to be like, why are they decorating with skulls? This seems so depressing. Like, you know, uh, Patty actually bakes the audience cookies and serves them throughout the show. I actually got to walk people and show them, you know, well, this is where Frankie, and the interesting thing about the show is that I was telling this story about being homeless and losing my dog and you got to sit in my pretty cool, beautiful new house with my new dog. Like it was a weird, like contextually, people were like, wait, like what is happening? And it was, the r it was a really cool show to do because <clears throat> afterwards you have these 10 people in your home. Uh, the least strangers I ever had was two, but there were a few nights where literally not one person was a friend or person I knew. So my husband was the producer slash the bodyguard. He's six and a half feet tall, so he keeps us safe. Uh, and people would come over and at the end, we'd have conversation, and people were usually, it was, it was an interesting social experiment to see, like, will people linger and just, like, hammer whiskey and, like, not get out of my damn house? Do you know what I mean? But they, they all, like, the shortest was 15 minutes, the longest was half an hour. And they sat with me, and they talked to me about their pets, about their parents they lost, about um, any number of things. And for me, one of the most interesting things was, you know, I had some liberal friends that saw it and thought that I gave a woman kind of dimension and heart that they didn't like seeing in the world. And I said, well, let's talk about that. And they're like, I don't think she needs to be elevated as someone who, you know, is a latent racist and blah, 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 you know, with all these political beliefs. And I was like, well, she's real, you know? But then one night I had a couple and they lingered and uh, as they were about to leave, she turned around and she said, I just want you to know and I was like, oh, God, here it comes, right? And I knew that they were from Orange County, which if you know California, <laughs> yeah. And she says, I want you to know we don't have the same political beliefs as you. And I was like, brace, brace, abort. Um, and she said, but I feel like everyone is going through something right now. And I want to thank you because I, I've never heard anyone talk about your fear and your anger and rage about what's happening the way that you did. And I have it the same way in reverse, and I didn't realize that maybe we have a lot in common. And she literally was saying the thing that I wanted the poster of the show, like to sell it, like culturally, like she was literally, I was like, what? And then she started crying, and her husband looked at me and said, can she give you a hug, which I thought was so weird that he was like, can she give you a hug? And I was like, sure. <laughs> And she gave me a hug, and then they left. And, you know, it's interesting. You know, there's an email. I invite some people to keep up if they want to know, you know, and I, and I actually did. I sent them an email being like, hey, thank you for coming. I hope you're okay. And I, and I never heard back, and it made me wonder, like, is there a magic to that kind of environment where you maybe feel like in the auspice of theater and this housing you can all connect and get along and you're the same, and then that goes away once you're back in Orange County, <laughs> like, you know, uh, doing whatever you're doing. Um, but it was a really – it was a really um, – it was a really fascinating project. And then, um, and just in closing, the last few things uh, are really just, um, oh, I'll just show you a little clip real quick. How and then we'll. Do you have? Oh, yeah. oh, oh I, do. I have a little dog. His name is Bitsy. Bitsy. I know I love him. You know, David told me a thing for when I pray about saying namaste. Mm -hmm. I've never <laughs> heard it before, but I like it because I use it all sorts of ways now. Mm -hmm. To pray, it's like namaste. And then if you want to be sexy, it's like namaste. <laughs> and then I can also say, namaste, bitchy, get up on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and that works too. Just right on the planet. Bitsy is my little tiny applehead chihuahua. Oh, well, he's so old. I swear, he's one of those old little dogs that the smaller they get, the bigger their dog is. It's like a hot dog bun. <laughs> it's adorable. Oh, at night, we have to catheter him so he can pee, but it's working out. <laughs> I went away. I said, Bob, don't forget to catheter Bitsy. He said, I'm not going to catheter Bitsy. And I said, Bob, I did it for you. Do it for the dog. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so that was just a little idea of, of what that's like. And, and that was really fun because I actually, uh, I actually gave, uh, a, God bless the woman that got the makeover from me the night of that show. She really left looking like a tropical fish. Um, um, but yeah, and now, you know, that kind of brings me to now. Um, uh, I'm, um, this is Risk, the show that I host and direct, uh, the LA version of. It's also in New York. It's a podcast that you should listen to. Um, has a lot of great stories. People. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was gonna. What time are we at? Is it seven twenty? I think that's it. Unless anyone, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, unless anyone has any questions before we go, I was gonna tell another story, but I think maybe a Q and A would be better. And then you can get out of here and eat, do whatever you're doing. Huh? You rather just another story? No Q and A. I'll do another story if y'all don't want to do a Q&A. I love that I'm like, it, but now it feels like I'm holding you hostage. Like, you could say, no, we want to ask questions, ask one and be done, but now you've got to sit here for eight minutes, whatever. Um, I'll do it real quick and then we'll be done. Uh, so um, a few years ago, not, uh, well, actually two years ago, and this is sort of connected to the story I told earlier. Um, like I said, 2018, uh, the beginning of it was a rough year. And uh, it really did feel like on January 2nd, uh, it was rough. Um, that Christmas, we had driven, my husband and I, all the way from Pennsylvania uh, with my sister-in-law and my nephew, Leo. Um, and they were moving to LA, and it was really fun, because Jack and I didn't have any family in LA. And we got here January 1st, or to LA January 1st, and I woke up January 2nd to the sound of a, a bunch of glass shattering. And I opened the door, and Leo, my six-year-old nephew, is standing in the hallway, surrounded. He's in a mountain of shards of glass from a piece he's knocked off the wall. And he's looking at us saying, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And we're like, don't move, don't move. And our little dog, Charlie, is trying to get at him. And we're like, uh, and he's crying. And luckily his mom comes in from behind with shoes on and like airlifts him out of the glass, right? We're cleaning up the glass. And as we're cleaning up the glass, we get an email from the two people that we'd rented this beautiful house from that we invited his family to come and live in with us only four months earlier telling us that they are uh, evicting us and cutting away our two-year lease we'd signed because they are moving to Scotland and selling the house. Literally, the glass is not in the garbage can as we're processing this. And then within 30 minutes of that, we hear Leo scream, and we look in the living room, and our little dog, Charlie, is on his back. His legs are stiff, and he's having a grand mal seizure. And it really did feel like 2018 was like coming for us. <laughs> and and the next few months were hard. You know, we went through a lot of uh, treatment for the dog, and, uh, and unfortunately, it, he didn't make it. And when, you know, and when we lost him, um, it was hard, but Leo turned out to be someone, my nephew, that was really hard for me to see. Um, I love being around kids. Uh, I, I think kids are the best, like, improv partners. Uh, they go from one thing to the next. I remember when Leo was four, I was talking to him once about when his mom was pregnant with him, and he's like, oh, you know, before I was born, I did a lot of stuff in her tummy. And I was like, what? And he was like, oh, I was just like hanging out in there. I was like, what do you do? And he's like, I mainly watch TV. <laughs> and I was like, well, what did you watch? And he was like, and then he proceeded to scroll through like a guide of shows that like if we got in a room at Netflix, we would sell. Like they were the best shows that he was just making up. And then it was maybe like, a year after that, I guess he was five, I remember one time, he broke a rubber band. And you know when kids are little, they don't understand what things have value and what don't. Like a break is a break. It's like a thing they made wrong. And he was holding this rubber band. He looked and he's like, oh my God. And I just said, well, we're going to have to call the rubber band repairman now. And he was like, a rubber band repairman? And I was like, yeah, we can call him. He can look into it. And then like he just decided to like, yes, and me, but, but with like, doubt you know he was like how much does this cost and i was like well depends on the break isn't a new rubber band just cheaper than the rubber so like but we talked about it for 30 minutes <laughs> and it was so fun to be with him but in light of being so depressed he was like a person i wanted to avoid right i wanted to see my few close friends so i could weep over burritos and then not break down in front of my beautiful six-year-old nephew who had literally just moved to la and had a whole new life two you know two months earlier so for a while, I, I didn't see him. I found ways to not see my nephew for like two months. And then one day, do you remember that 80s ballad, All Cried Out? Like the notion of being all cried out, it's in a lot of pop songs. And I think it's funny, the idea that you just can't physiologically anymore. Like, uh, and one morning I woke up and I knew that I was maybe done because that Sarah McLachlan SPCA, in the arms of the 
angel with like the dogs and the cages and the cat with one ear. And I watched it and I watched it like data from like Star Trek Next Generation. I was like, oh, that's terrible. I was like, oh, I think I'm done crying. Like I feel nothing right now. It was like there was no like weather inside of me. I was almost like plastic. And I was like, okay, okay, I'm maybe gonna be okay. And that afternoon, Leo's mother was like, hey, we miss you, can we hang out? I was like, yeah, let's go, let's go have tacos. So Claire, my sister-in-law, Leo, my nephew, and my husband Jack and me all meet for tacos. And we're sitting, we're having the best time. Jack and his sister are catching up and Leo's talking to me. And in the sweetest, most innocent way, he just says at one point, he was like, what's a tuber? I'm like, what? A tuber. And I'm like, do you mean a tumor? He's like, yeah. I just want to understand why they couldn't take it outside of Charlie. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So then, and then he starts asking me, he's like, can't they microwave it? Couldn't they take it out and put it in a microwave and then put it back? Which clearly, he doesn't understand what a tumor is, right? You just don't want it back inside you at all. But then I realized I'm basically trying to simply describe radiation to like a six-year-old. Like, well, that's smart that you're thinking that way, buddy, because it is kind of like what, so I'm talking about the whole thing and it's, I feel fine. And then at one point, he reaches over and he puts his tiny hand on mine. Like I literally have like queso in the other hand and he's like, are you sad? And I'm like, do you want ice cream? Like I just blurted. it. It's 9.30 a.m. It's breakfast. His mother looks across the table from like, and she's like, because you know, you can't like say that to a, that's all they'll think about all day is like David said, we're getting ice cream, right? So it's, it's a few minutes later and we're walking down the street to get this kid ice cream. He couldn't be happier. And we're walking down the way and we get to the little ice cream store and he has this ice cream he likes called Cookie Monster. It's like toxic blue and they have it at this place. Now, he's very little. He's in the, like, the bottom 10 percentile of his age group. Tiny, tiny little hands. So when he likes it on a cone, but he still needs a cup, if you've seen this child approach. So that you have the big thing and the cone and then you have the cup so you can like, you know, free hand. We're walking down the street, blue like across his face, blue hand, blue, just like walking. And we get to the stoplight, and it's a crosswalk, and Claire and Jack walk ahead of us, and I go to cross, and I look, and Leo's looking up at me like, because Leo wants to be a good boy, and he knows he has to hold a hand across the street, but he's not in a position to do that. Uh, he's just dripping with blue everywhere. He's got the scoop and the cup, and he, and he looks at me, he's like, ah, and like the thing is blinking, and I was like, buddy, can I just grab your shirt and like lead you? And he's like, yeah. So I grab his shirt, you know, like, get over here. You know, I think it looks terrible to people. And I'm just like walking across the street with him like this. And we're halfway across the street. And he looks up and he says, it's kind of like I'm on a leash, huh? And I'm like, mm-hmm, yep. And then we get up to the curb and he's like, if you want, I can be Charlie now. I, we're in front of a, a Forever 21, I remember, and I, <laughs> I burr, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, I'm not done crying. <laughs> and I, I get down on my knees because he's so low, and I'm like hugging him in front of this Forever 21, and I remember looking over Leo's shoulder. His mom and my husband were up ahead, and I saw his mom be like, oh, and go back, and I, sw I will always remember Jack grabbing her being like, he needs this. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> let him do this. Um, and I'm like, and I'm like crying, and as I'm crying, I'm like, this is what I didn't want to happen. Like, my nephew's six years old, and he doesn't understand this. This is probably so confusing for him. And as I'm crying on his shoulder, I realize that he's crying on mine. I feel like moisture on my sh shoulder. But then I realize that it's like, it's not, it's not warm. <laughs> and, I, and I look in our reflection in Forever 21, and as I am weeping, weeping, Leo has the ice cream, he's hugging me, but he's like, ah, God, he's trying so hard, he's like, ah, to get in his mouth, um, and, and it was funny, because uh, I hugged him, and I, I, I pulled myself together, you know, and, he, and he went away seemingly like, okay, bye, you know, because they don't remember that, right, um, I got better, we got Frankie, we got this house, and one day I was sitting in the front yard with Leo, and we were watching the sunset with the dogs, and uh, I, had, I had this necklace, or this little uh, bracelet that I'd gotten with stones on it from some like new age shop, because I was really in it. Uh, and uh, it had broken, and Leo started playing with it, and some of those stones rolled off the table. And I was like, oh, buddy, don't, don't, don't play with that. I broke it. I, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. And he just pauses, and he looks at me, and he's like, you could take it to your rubber band repairman. <laughs> 
And I was like, you remember that? And he just reached over and he pulls up my hand and he's like, I remember a lot of things. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Thanks for coming. I'll see you on the grounds or at lounge if that's happening. Make it happen is like the, the message there. <laughs>